You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Welcome to From Beneath the Hollywood Sign. If you love old movies, Hollywood history, or the golden age of filmmaking, you've come to the right place. This is the podcast that talks about amazing stories of Tinseltown from another era and fascinating conversations with writer-producer Steve Kubine and actress-writer Nan McNamara. So Steve, did Ava Gardner and Howard Hughes have a good relationship? Well, they did until he dislocated her jaw. What? Well, don't worry. She hit him back with an ashtray. From Beneath the Hollywood Sign is the gin joint for you. Recorded in Chicago, Illinois, with your hosts, Ken, Matt, Neil, and Jeff, this is Triviality. The cream of the crop! Hello and welcome to Triviality, the game where a lack of seriousness meets a little bit of knowledge. My name is Ken, I'm going to be your host today, and today we have some special guests coming in on Skype. We have David Raffetto, the famous gentleman from our Question 5 submissions. How are you doing, David? I'm doing well. Glad to be here. And uh, Jason Goding, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. They're going to be playing as a team against our team of Jeff and Matt. And we also have Neil here in the studio. He's going to be functioning as a scorekeeper, but he also thought he'd throw his hat in the ring. So he's going to be playing as an individual. Uh, His ego is not on the line here as he's playing by himself, but uh, we'll see how he does. It, It could turn out well for Neil. This is a pretty pop culture heavy round so i'm basically score keeping and then if i do well we're going to count the score <laughs> that i have for myself and if i do poorly I, we're not going to count it officially yeah so essentially this is a three-way match uh two versus two versus one i feel like even though neil's not playing we'll still spend some time waiting for him to answer <laughs> so gentlemen you want to give us a little background on uh, how you got into trivia and uh, maybe how you got into our show uh, I'll talk first because I've, I've really got to credit Jason for sort of officially getting me into it. Um, I mean, as a kid, right, you watch game shows and where in the world is Carmen San Diego and stuff like that. But, you know, I never played competitively, never really did the pub quiz thing. But um, Jason ended up uh, being my brother-in-law and kind of moved around the corner. And he encouraged us, hey, let's show up at a venue and test our knowledge and see how we do. And so uh, we did pretty well, actually. And uh, went through a couple places, and we've sort of found now a, a home pub and a home team that uh, we've been with for, gosh, maybe close to a year now. Yeah, how about you, Jason? Uh, I know you said David said he got you, or you got him into trivia, but uh, any uh, any initial stories for you? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm just, um, I lived in Dallas a couple of years ago, and I used to play with um, some coworkers. Uh, we did the Geeks Who Drink. Um, pub quizzes uh, at, at a couple of different places. Um, but then, yeah, then after moving here, uh, we've just been pretty much going going every week. And uh, yeah, just, it's been a lot of fun. Well, uh, where are you guys coming to us from today? Uh, Houston, Texas. Very nice. Right. And uh, do you guys have an impromptu team name that you'd like to, to have against our, our Triviality team? Since, uh, since we're from Texas, how about we do Team Yeehaw? We'll go with that. Team Yeehaw. Perfect. All right, and I'll, I'll try to put some some guts into my yeehaw. <laughs> All right, without further ado, we'll go over the rules really quick for our listeners. 20 questions in a variety of topics worth 10 points apiece and split into two rounds. At halftime, there will be a special swing round designed by me where players can rack up some extra points. At the end of regulation, players will enter the final round with the points that they've accumulated and will have a chance to wager 0 to 30 points on five categorized questions. At the end of the game, someone will be named the cream of the crop. I am the cream in the World Wrestling Federation. All right, so without further ado, let's begin with question one. And it's a sports question here for Matt. (laughs) All right, so first of all, there has only been one head coach in basketball to win both the NCAA National Championship and the NBA title. Who is this coach? Hmm. Where's where's your guys' uh, expertise fall? Uh, I would say we're both pretty strong in sports, and I watch a fair bit of college yeah. basketball. But um, yeah, we we we, we complement each other pretty well. I'm sort of more. I've got my undergraduate and graduate training in humanities, so um, I would say above average in history and literature, philosophy. Cool. My schooling was in uh, information systems. Uh, Doesn't but, come up uh, too much in trivia, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I, I like history and uh, science, too, though, so I right. usually do well categories. 
Okay, so uh, looks like we have some perplexed looks in the studio. Um, the gentlemen are discussing, and uh, Team Yeehaw, also not too sure at the moment, um, but it looks like they're going to go ahead and lock uh, lock a guess in. Is that right, guys? Yeah, we're locked yeah. in. We're good. Okay. Reluctantly so. Do you guys want to want to discuss a little bit? Sure. Um, so I got stuck on Larry Brown for a while. Uh, he's coached one with the Pistons in 04 and i know he coached in the ncaa for a long period of time um but i don't think he ever actually won an ncaa title uh so i was thinking rudy tomjanovich who won with the rockets in 04 and 05 and i think he was an ncaa coach at houston before when they won in 79 uh but i might be wrong there um and Jeff had no thoughts on this whatsoever. So you're locking in with? With Rudy Tomjanovich. Okay, how about you, Neil? Uh, I wasn't too sure um, on this question, so I just kind of was going down the line of famous coaches. Um, I knew a lot of famous NCAA coaches. Didn't know if they coached in the NBA, but I figured um, this coach had a, a strong relationship, I think, with Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, possibly, just a, a little callback to the show. So I went with Wooden. Okay, mm -hmm. and uh, Team Yeehaw. Well, if it's if it's Rudy Tomjanovich, we're never going to live it down because he did. <laughs> he won two championships in Houston when we were living here. Yeah. We we so we brainstormed uh, names of people who had coached sort of in both arenas, but we we didn't really feel confident that they would won in both arenas. So we ended up floating Pat Riley as our name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, I did hear the name we were looking for oh, mentioned man. once. Uh, Matt should have gone with his gut. It was Larry Brown. Oh. oh wow! Do you know? Uh, do you know he won the title with an NCAA? Oh no, I didn't think so. <laughs> <laughs> uh. All right, change of pace here for question two. Who is the composer and lyricist behind the following works? Assassins, a funny thing happened on the way to the forum, and Sweeney Todd. I'm in. This is more in Neil's wheelhouse, clearly. Jeff and uh, Matt, not looking too sure. And uh, what are you guys feeling about this one? So, uh, I actually, we own the DVD, A Funny Thing Happened on the Way to the Forum, because my wife was a big uh, Latin scholar in high school. And mm -hmm. so she's viewed that movie probably a hundred times. Uh, that doesn't help my it doesn't <laughs> help my knowledge of the question, unfortunately. I checked that back case, maybe. There's also that episode of The Office where Andy's. <laughs> yeah, this uh, composer, lyricist's uh, style is very recognizable in the theater community because of the way he writes his music. A lot of words back, back and forth. Um, oh, long the stanzas. Doesn't help. I need more clues. Okay, so it looks like uh, Team Triviality locking in with more or less a guess. Um, so Oh, it's less a guess. I think we're going to lock in with uh, Tim Rice. Tim Rice. Yeah. Okay, how about Team Triviality? Uh, well, Matt insisted I put Hans Gruber for this, um, but uh, because we couldn't think of any other lyricists, we too went Tim Rice. <laughs> okay, wow. and uh, by far the most confident is the uh, <laughs> the man standing alone, Neil. It's funny you said Hans because you were half. Oh. No, I'm just kidding. No, uh, it's <laughs> there's no way it's Hans. It's, uh, it's like he's not a lyricist. <laughs> uh, the answer is Stephen Sondheim. Uh, Stephen Sondheim yeah. is correct. Good job, Neil. Well Thank done, you. Neil. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. At least it's a name I've heard. So here's here's something that's uh, that's not gonna tickle Neil as much as that last question. A elements. cycloid is a math term indicating a path that is traced by a point on what kind of structure? I'm out. I'm kidding. I know the answer. We're good. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> triviality is in right away with the response. Yeah. And I'm, how about you guys? I'm not entirely certain about something though. So we were we were debating between either a, a part of an arc or part of a circle mm -hmm. and sort of our logic being that an arc is the start or part of a circle that would be sort of the more general answer and if you need a more specific we could provide it but our final answer we locked in with was arc okay and uh neil uh i have no reasoning obviously i'm not the the science guy so when i, I heard the word cycloid i thought of cyclops and an eyeball so uh going off of that uh, you know, random logic. I said a sphere. Okay, and how about you guys? So I feel like you can, you could theoretically trace um, this shape on almost any polygon, um, but I, we went with circle. Okay, so I've muted uh, Team Houston really quick to get some specificity. 
Just explain it if you could. It's 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 rotating. It's it's rotating through a distance. So basically, like the uh, a cycloid is like if you put a dot on like a wheel and you rotated the wheel, the path that that dot follows as it travels is what the cycloid is. Okay, I've gotten some specificity from Team Triviality, and if I could get some specificity, um, if you could just describe what what you think it is. So it's, it's almost, so it's almost like on a point um, on a curved plane, you're following along the curve of that particular plane. And I guess with the with the circle, it's right. I, arc is what we locked in with, but it's right. You're going here's a point, and here's a point, and rather than a straight line, you're traversing that curved plane like that. Does okay. that make sense? Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and give points to Team Triviality on this one. Uh, Jeff described it very specifically. So it's a point on a. He he said you could do this with any polygon, which I suppose he's correct. Yes. But it's a point on a wheel, basically as it rolls. So it would make kind of like a, a wave form over 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 a path. Okay? Uh, so fair enough. So Team Triviality is going to get points on this one, unfortunately. Good job, um, guys. Team Yeehaw okay. is going to be uh, be without for this question. You, you might be not surprised at all to know this, but um, I once watched a YouTube video about why we don't make tires out of squares, and they use cycloids to demonstrate Did, did how... you have to watch? <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't have to, Ken. Uh, I don't think you understand how my brain works. I wanted to watch. Yeah. Okay, moving on to question four. A little bit of geography for you, gentlemen. The Yucatan Peninsula separates what two bodies of water only being connected by the Yucatan Channel? We're, we're locked in. So what, what I'm struggling to remember is, is, I know it's in Mexico, but I'm struggling to remember what part of Mexico the Yucatan Peninsula mm. is. And um, so the one on the West Coast jutting down, I'm pretty sure is like Baja, California. Mm. So I don't think that's it. I'm pretty sure the Yucatan Peninsula is so on the bottom of Mexico, it juts up back into um, into the Caribbean. So uh, the only thing I could think of is it would be like the Caribbean and the Atlantic Ocean. So, I mean, I'm good with the Caribbean and Atlantic Ocean. That's fine. And then then I think that's what we're good with. Okay. Um, so let's, my geography knowledge is right. So Triviality locks in with uh, Caribbean Sea and Atlantic Ocean. Yes. Neil? Uh, I had no idea. I just put Pacific Ocean and Gulf of Mexico. Ah, okay. That's what I Those are on two different sides, but okay. We're yeah, going to go exactly. with uh, <laughs> Team Yeehaw. So, so we said the Gulf of Mexico and the Caribbean Sea. And Team Yeehaw is going to be getting uh, points on this one. That is absolutely correct. We were halfway there. And now for question five, which I conjured up with uh, our good friend and fan of the show, Dan Miller. Um, this is the most Chicago-centric question that probably will ever be asked on Triviality, but I think um, our friends in Houston stand an equal chance to get this correct. It is a yes or no question. All right, 50%. 50% chance on both <laughs> both ends. So let's assume that disgraced and fired Chicago Bears kicker Connor Barth became a supervillain, and his evil plan was to blow himself up to the size which he can kick the Cloudgate sculpture, which is better known to us here in Chicago as the Bean, through the antenna of the Willis Tower, which we know here in Chicago as the Sears Tower. Let's make a huge assumption and say that his kick propels the bean perfectly in a horizontal trajectory towards the antenna. Will the bean have enough clearance to pass through the antenna? Mm -hmm. So, horizontally, the bean is traveling through the antenna. The odds of Connor Barth kicking that bean through any uprights (laughs) is very slim. (laughs) Yeah, this question is flawed in itself because he would not make that kick. I believe that it's inversely proportional to how well he can keep keep his job uh, <laughs> oh he's gone now so yeah <laughs> so yes or, yes or no the yes or no the bean will pass through the antenna so basically what's wider the that's antenna that's what the i bean. think yeah so we're we're in if if you guys want to talk right. about beans and willis we feel like we have a better than average chance because both of us on a 50 50 agreed so <laughs> i'm in okay how are you guys feeling in texas so I've seen the bean once <clears throat> for all of about five minutes, uh, but I'm going to pass the mic to the guy who used to live in Chicago. Let him give our answer. Okay. So I'm thinking the bean would pass between the two. Okay. So your your answer is yes, Neil. Yes. No scientific reasoning. I just I just said false. Yeah. Okay. I I I don't think the bean's that big, uh, and I know that the antennas are pretty far apart. So. Yeah, I mean the the bean is pretty big, but when you're looking at the antenna, they are you know a thousand feet away from you. Yeah. So, so we said yes. <laughs> okay. The correct answer is yes. All right. So Team Triviality is going to get points, and Team Yeehaw is going to get points. 
The bean at its widest point is 66 feet, and the antenna at its uh, narrowest point is 75 feet. Oh, so it's close. Yeah, it's pretty close. All right, moving on to question six. What is the shared name between the team name of the University of Arkansas at Monticello and a classic Chicago punk band that formed in 1989? And uh, it's a name for a beetle that typically feeds on cotton. Hmm. Team Eho is locked in. They, they, they feed on the, the buds and the flowers specifically. Like a stag beetle or a longhorn beetle or... I'm trying to get you to get to punk bands. That's what I'm trying to... Okay. We, I, this is... Is it? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Looks like everybody's in. Sure. Uh, let's start with triviality. Um, we had nothing for a long period of time and then just went in with thinking of stag beetles and said the stags. Okay. Let's go with Neil. I, I just wrote down the Lawrence Arms, which obviously it will not be. I was thinking of the Lawrence Arms. Okay. And how about you guys? We went with the Bowl Weevils. Oh, that the is The Bowl right. Weevils is correct. Good job, guys. <sighs> one, which one of those hints uh, gave it to you? The, the Beatles. Yeah. The uh, Beatles. So, so in my head, I'm thinking, I know I know Arkansas Fayetteville's mascot. I know. I, I kind of pride myself on knowing mascots pretty well. I know yeah. Arkansas State. And then uh, whenever you gave the cotton clue, it sort of, ah, it finally, the, the, the gotcha. synapse, the brain finally connected. Gotcha. Yeah. Well, uh, outside of uh, Razorbacks, I'm lost in Arkansas. So it's kind of a sports question, kind of a, a music question, kind of a science question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mark one in each category. <laughs> All right, moving on to another science question. What kind of animal is a gooey duck? And I will accept uh, common names, but specifically I'm looking for the name of the order. All right, we wrote down a general answer and we're locked in. <laughs> I don't know how close I am, but it's closer than than a joke answer about a chewy duck. How, how are you guys feeling about gooey ducks? Uh, we're not feeling them too much at all. <laughs> we've, well, we've both heard this before, but can't pull it. Yeah, it, it's somewhere in the recesses of the brain, okay. and uh, I'm assuming I'm assuming it's not duck. So we're we're, we're still brainstorming. Yeah. Neil's okay. shaking his head. Yeah, I just I watched a video about this recently. But did not care enough to remember. I wrote something down. It's wrong, but you know. you're not being at least I have points on the board. Okay, everybody. Yeah, uh, you're actually competitive. Everybody, everybody locked. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're locked. we're locked. Okay, let's start with uh, Team Yeehaw this time. So we took a we took a stab at it and said amphibian. Um, I I know it's some kind of sea aquatic creature of some sort. Uh, okay. We guessed you're right sea so far. urchin. Sea urchin. Okay, how about Neil? I just put insect. Okay. Uh, well, uh, Jeff was the closest here, oh. but the answer is a clam. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, they're they're actually one of the largest clams and also one of the um, longest living animals. Uh, maybe that's what it was, longest living animals. All right, moving on to question eight. A 1980 volcanic eruption that is considered the costliest and deadliest in U.S. history took place in what state? Team Triviality locked in pretty quickly. Team Yeehaw's locked in also. Okay. And uh, Neil? So this was the deadliest in the United States? Mm hmm And what year was it? 1980. All right. I'm trying to trying to channel Pierce Brosnan yeah. uh, from Dante's Peak here. I knew this would which be Which I Dante's think was, <laughs> was Mount St. Helens, but I don't know where that is. So I'm just going to throw in Washington State. Okay. And Team Triviality? We also went to Washington State. Oh. And Team Yeehaw? We also said Washington. Points all around. All right. It was Mount St. Helens in Washington. Unfortunately, 57 people were killed in that eruption. 250 homes destroyed, 47 bridges, 15 miles of railway, and 185 miles of highway were destroyed. All right, moving on to a lighter category. This is a film question. Considering the film characters Jerry Conlon in the uh, film In the Name of the Father, and Danny Flynn in The Boxer are both imprisoned for IRA connections. It's a great coincidence that they are also both portrayed by what actor? I'm locked in. Mm -hmm. Team Yeehaw's locked in with the guests. Oh, Team okay. Yeehaw's in. Fair enough. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm assuming the IRA in question is the I Irish Republican Army. Yeah. So now I'm trying to go through like Irish actors or maybe English actors who ironically played Play an Irish, Irish role. Yeah. yeah. Um, do you know the period of either of the films? No, the, I think The Boxer is a, a 90s movie, early 90s, okay. but I could be way off there. I'll give you guys a hint. He's really good. Uh, 
<laughs> Neil's quick take. Okay. Oh yeah, I need a, I need a hot take every episode. <laughs> All right. This is not John Travolta. Uh, no. Uh, and if I could have any movie, it would be John Travolta playing a member of the IRA. <laughs> <laughs> Jeez. Oh. Oh, like, oh my god. Uh. I got nothing. Are we gonna go? Let's, Colin Farrell is a joke, and yeah. call it a day. Okay. All right, Colin Farrell for Team Triviality. Let's go with Team Yeehaw. Um, we said James Kahn. James Kahn? Ah, Jim, Jim Kahn. Kahn. <laughs> All, right. All right, Neil. Uh, this actor uh, I would call uh, Steven Spielberg skipper on the set of his film Lincoln. That would be Daniel Day-Lewis. Oh. Daniel Day-Lewis is correct. When's the boxer? That's actually 2000s, isn't it? No, it's earlier. Okay. Yeah. Hey. All right. We're going to move on to a little bit of literature here. The Man in the Iron Mask is a section of the third novel in a series, the first novel being by far the most well-known. What is the name of the first in the series? Team Yeehaw's Locked In. Okay. Do you know who wrote that? No. It's a book. <laughs> Come on. Sorry I asked. Come on. It's uh, some kind of Three Musketeers nonsense, right? I don't remember. I've never seen the Man in the Iron the Mask. The Man in the so. Iron Mask is there's like a a twin and they put him in a mask or something and they tell him he's like disfigured, but he turns out to be Leonardo DiCaprio. So he can't <laughs> that was just a little. Here's a hot take for you: a, a studio that that put Leonardo DiCaprio in a mask the entire movie. <laughs> Bad choice. Bad choice. Yeah. It turns out he was handsome the whole time. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's it's a uh, swashbuckling swords and nonsense. I don't know anything about it though. Three Musketeers is all I could think of, and it's not. But outside of Three Musketeers, I got that's nothing. fine. We can just do that. All right, Three Musketeers. Okay, triviality in with guess of Three Musketeers. Uh, Neil. So, um, thinking of the movie, uh, for some reason the name like Alexander Desplat or Depla kept coming in my head, and I do remember it. I think having something to do with the Three Musketeers that either they save him or he's part of it or D'Artagnan. I don't remember, but anyway, I wrote Three Musketeers. Okay, and uh, Team Yeehaw. So, so we had two books in mind. Three Musketeers was one of them. That was not the one we wrote down. So I'm a little nervous now. We put the Count of Monte Cristo. Uh, okay, uh, you were thinking of the name Alexander Dumas. Dumas, okay. And uh, he wrote both The Count of Monte Cristo and The Three Musketeers. However, the correct no answer is can. The Three Musketeers. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> no way. <laughs> I was a little worried when they said The Count of Monte Cristo because I was like, that's a Ken question if there ever was I, I couldn't have backed my way to that. <laughs> well, immediately <laughs> I was going to put Count of Monte Cristo knowing Ken, but I'm right. like, he's asked a Count of Monte Cristo question before. I have, I have. Okay, so we're here at the end of reg- uh, the first half of regulation. Can we get the score update from Neil? Well, your surprise scorekeeper is uh, happy to report that uh, it is all tied up at 40 across wow. the board. Wow. All right. Good game so far from everybody. That could all change here in the swing round. Uh, we're going to be doing classic movie lines. Uh, I have looked at a list of uh, some of the most famous movie lines of all time. I'm going to read the line, and I just want you to tell me what movie that's from. Ten questions, five points apiece. Okay, so starting off the swing round, number one. I'm walking here. I'm walking here. Number two. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. Number three. I'm having an old friend for dinner. Number four. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. Number five. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. Number six. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Number seven. I am serious, and don't call me Shirley. Number eight, I wish I knew how to quit you. Number nine, I'll have what she's having. And number 10, go ahead, make my day. The one that's really plaguing me, the one that uh, is going to drive me absolutely bonkers, is number six. The greatest trick that the devil ever pulled was convincing people he didn't exist. I've seen this movie Mm -hmm. a lot, I'm sure. End of days. No. It's not end of day. No. I'm going to ram my fist into your stomach, you <laughs> choir boy. Five, six, and eight is what we're struggling with. Every, everybody's locked in in here, so we're not going to mute you again. But you okay, can, you okay. Can that's talk. fine. That's fine. All right, we're in. We're in. Okay. All right, with uh, some discussion, everybody's in on these questions. And we are just going to start right off with number one. 
And let's start off with Team Yeeha. Uh, this, some of these are going to be brutal for us. We put, I, when I heard the quote, I feel like I can hear it in sort of like an Italian-American accent. And Joe Pesci kept coming to mind, so we said, my cousin Vinny. Mm. Okay. And how about you guys? We were thinking similar lines and said casino. So you, you got the same guy. All right. Uh, Neil? Uh, it was <clears throat> a film that was famously rated X, the Midnight Cowboy. That's right. It is Midnight Cowboy. Uh, uh, it was Dustin Hoffman who said it. Uh, it was an improvised line as he almost got run over by a car. But he, <laughs> yeah, you're right. Uh, the line was kind of set in that sort of uh, New York dialect, I believe. Uh, okay, moving on to the next one. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here. This is the war room. A uh, little bit of uh, trouble for some of us. Uh, triviality, let's start with you guys. We said Dr. Strangelove. And how about you guys, Team Yeehaw? Yeah, th- th- this was the one we sat on the most and really didn't get an answer. Uh, we-, we just put War Games as a guess. Okay, and Neil? Uh, there's a, f- a scene that Ken and I uh, love of uh, Peter Sellers trying not to sig Heil. Uh, that would be uh, Dr. Strangelove or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb. Yep, very good movie. It is Dr. Strangelove. All right, moving on to number three. I'm having an old friend for dinner. Uh, Neil, let's start with you on that one. Silence of the Lambs? Okay, Triviality? We, too, felt that was a Hannibal Lecter line, Silence of the Lambs. And yeehaw. Well, we went with that, too, Silence of the Lambs. All right, points all around on that one. Mm-hmm. Moving on. I'm not bad. I'm just drawn that way. Well, let's start with Team Yeehaw there. Yeah, we, we the, the line didn't sound familiar. Based on the context clues, we just put Roger Rabbit. Who framed Roger, Roger Rabbit? Rabbit? All right, Neil? Uh, I also put Who Framed Roger yeah, Rabbit. The classic Jessica Rabbit line from Roger Rabbit. Who yeah. Framed Roger Rabbit, yeah. Around, uh, correct all around. All right, next. This one was a little bit more difficult. I am big. It's the pictures that got small. Let's start with triviality. <laughs> we had no idea, so I just put one of my favorite movies, Death to Smoochie. Okay, let's move on to Neil. Uh, shout out to our friend Jeffrey Seguritan and his favorite filmmaker, Billy Wilder. That would be uh, Norma Desmond in Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. And uh, Team Yeeha. Uh We played Casablanca as a guest. Ah. It is Sunset Boulevard, so Neil's going to get some points on this one. But uh, Team Triviality was discussing maybe it's an aging actor, and you guys were mm-hmm. absolutely correct. <laughs> You're right there, yep. Moving on to the next one. The greatest trick the devil ever pulled was convincing the world he didn't exist. Um, what did we have, Triviality? I feel like um, this was a Kevin Spacey line from the film uh, The Usual Suspects. Okay. Team Eha? You said The Exorcist. And uh, Neil? That would be The Usual Suspects. Yep. You guys were right. Unfortunately uttered by Kevin Spacey. Um, <laughs> bad timing on that one. Well, I heard uh, Christopher Plummer is going to go in for the re-release of the DVD and uh, take over for him. <laughs> All right. Moving on. I am serious and don't call me Shirley. Let's start with Neil. Uh, that would be uh, the classic uh, spoof airplane. And Team Yeehaw? We also said airplane. And Triviality? Airplane exclamation point. Points <laughs> all around. All right. I wish I knew how to quit you, Triviality. Uh, this one we weren't really sure on, so I went with the classic chick flick, Love Actually. Uh, our friends in Houston? Uh, we said Brokeback Mountain. Oh. Neil? Brokeback Mountain. Oh. It is Brokeback Mountain, yes. And another uh, romantic film. I'll have what she's having. What did you guys say? That's uh, When Harry Met Sally. Neil? Yep. uh, The line was uh, spoken by uh, Rob Reiner's mother in the film, When Harry Met Sally. And Team Houston. We also went with uh, When Harry Met Sally. All right. Great. And this last one might be a little bit tricky. So let's go ahead with uh, Team Triviality on Go Ahead, Make My Day. Well, the fact that you said it's tricky makes me think that our answer of Dirty Harry is incorrect. And uh, Team Yeehaw? We said Dirty Harry, too. And Neil? Uh, So that would actually be the fourth film in the series, uh, directed by Clint Eastwood, called Sudden Impact. Ah. Sudden Impact is correct. Uh, Neil had asked me if if I wanted this answer or the the easy answer, and I said I want the correct answer, which is (laughs) Sudden Impact. All right, so uh, let's tally those scores really quick. All right, so after the swing round, in third place currently is Team Yeehaw with 65 points. Uh, Right above them with 70 points is Team Triviality. And in the lead, surprisingly, with 90 points is me. All right, so that uh, swing round proved to be lucrative to Neil, uh, which is why I thought maybe he would do okay playing by himself. But let's see how this next round treats him, as there's a couple less pop culture film questions for him. Getting right into number one. 
Don't swap horses in the middle of a stream was the campaign slogan of what president striving for re-election? Got it. Okay. Jeff in immediately. Looks like Neil is in. Triviality is in. So you guys can speak freely. <clears throat> yeah. So our thought was, uh, I know Ronald Reagan was an actor in a lot of uh, old Western movies. And so mm -hmm. that seemed like a metaphor that would sort of fit him and resonate with uh, his voters and his fan base. So uh, we locked in Reagan. Okay. Not a bad, uh, not a bad thought process. Uh, let's move on to Neil. Uh, I had no thought process, really. I knew uh, Teddy Roosevelt was uh, a rough rider, was always on horses. And that was that was really all my uh, my mm -hmm. thinking there. So I went with Teddy Roosevelt. Okay. And Triviality seemed pretty confident, thanks to Jeff. Uh, what did you guys have? So I feel like um, this is more of a reference to the fact that um, you you wouldn't change course uh, when things are getting rough. You wouldn't just abandon it and uh, and just change course for no reason. Um, so I feel like uh, that, that would be an Abraham Lincoln thing to do. Um, especially considering he was, uh, they were in the middle of the Civil War. And uh, Jeff's uh, reasoning was exactly correct. It was Abe Lincoln um, referencing uh, the heat of the Civil War. So going into question two, what historical ruler was once captured by pirates, demanded their ransom amount be doubled, and then hunted the captors down after release, sentencing them to die by crucifixion? Ooh. I don't know, but this person sounds awesome. Yeah. I should double check my facts on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you might want to. I'm in with uh, probably a wrong answer. Is your answer uh, Captain Phillips? <laughs> I'm, I'm the look captain. at me. Look at me. I'm the captain now. Okay, so after some discussion, it looks like uh, Team Yeeha is locked in. Uh, Neil looks locked in. And uh, Triviality, what were you guys thinking? Uh, we were thinking a lot of things. Yeah, you're still discussing. I, I've, written, right? I've written down uh, Charlemagne, Genghis Khan, William the Conqueror, uh, Vlad uh, the Impaler. Yeah, we we tried to go through history's great brutes. Um, <laughs> you'd have to be a real vindictive so and so to try and some kind um, of Suicide Squad, maybe something like that. <laughs> <laughs> sure, that's always the answer. I've sure, the answer like ten times that's on right. the show. That's <laughs> right. Uh, Deadshot. No, yeah, we're locking in with Napoleon. Okay, Napoleon, and uh, let's go with Team Yeehaw. Yeah, so we um, we thought about Genghis Khan too. The only thing that sort of we couldn't resolve was that Mongolia is not really not, at least in my in my mind's map, not anywhere near seas or oceans or anything. So not we ended up locking in with Hannibal. Mm. Okay, and Neil, I, I thought of just some famous brutes, I guess, but I, I didn't take too much time into it. I based solely on the fact for their uh, their penchant for uh, crucifying people. I just went with Caesar. And Neil is getting points on this question. <laughs> uh, Continuing his rampage is Neil. Uh, yeah, Julius Caesar is correct. Wow. I was and like, you need to be more specific because Caesar is just a title too. Yeah. No, uh, Julius I mean, Caesar. Come on. Yeah. yeah. Um, so w w did you grab that from maybe Spartacus a little bit? No, I just, I, 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 when I think of crucifixions, I think of Romans. I was like, who's the most famous Roman that I could think of? Mm -hmm. And I just put Caesar. There you go. Much better line of thought. That's All true. right. Well, moving on to question three. This game is turning out to be a little weird. From the Greek meaning producing cold, by what term are low temperature physics more commonly known? Yeah, we can lock in with that. All right. We're locked in. Okay. I, I mean, uh, I mean, I, and I'm, I'm there somewhere. I'm around the, yeah. <laughs> okay, everybody's locked in. Let's start with Neil. Uh, I just had a, threw a random word on the page to put thermodynamics. Okay, mm -hmm. not a bad guess. Triviality? I think thermo is more all, the whole range, so mm -hmm. not just necessarily hot or cold. Um, so this we have part of it, and then we got stuck. So yeah. w the cryo is the part we're certain of, as that means cold. Um, but we said cryomechanics. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. And let's go with Team Yeeha. Yeah, so we had cryogenics written down, and we thought, no, that's specific to like the human body and things like that. So we just took that prefix and stuck it on physics. We said cryophysics. Okay. Uh, the answer I was looking for is cryogenics. Don't believe it's uh, specific to biology. Mm -hmm. I think it's just how how um, things react under cold temperatures. So interesting. Just doing a quick double check here, but I'm pretty sure. I researched enough. No, it sounds. I believe you're right, but I just have to double check from. I was going to write that, sanity. but I was like, oh, I don't think that. May, I have no idea. If that makes sense. Anything that can bring Sylvester Stallone and. Yep. Uh, what Wesley we're getting Snipes confused back. on is uh, cryogenics is movement, and cryogenetics is freezing biological material. 
Uh, so they're very close. Uh, okay. yeah. <laughs> well, for the record, I wrote cryogenics. It, that is true. Uh, let the, let Matt, the record Matt show. Got I got question. a science question. <laughs> All right, moving on to number four. Again, this one might favor Neil a little bit. All right, Henry Fonda made a rare turn as a villain playing Frank in what Sergio Leone Western? I'm in. I've, I've got a guess on this one. Oh, good. Okay, it looks like Triviality and Neil are in. Hold on, hold on. Pretty memorable turn as a villain as well. Mm-hmm. Because he's kind of uh, usually the good guy. I'm pretty sure yeah, that's Sergio top Leone. Build, top that's my good guy. I'm not familiar with the works of Sergio Leone. He's got, he's uh, he went from saving people from the executioner to becoming the executioner. Mm. I'm only familiar with the works of Ennio Marcone. Ah. So. It's one of the best We're of like, all time. Or we can just say it if we need to. Okay, it looks like uh, all the teams locked in relatively quickly. Uh, Jeff had a uh, suggestion for Matt, and uh, Neil locked in right away after some discussion. Uh, team in Houston was able to come up with an answer, too. So let's begin with uh, Team Triviality. Um, so I feel like this is the good, the bad, and the ugly. Okay. Uh, team Yeehaw. Yeah, we didn't, despite our team name, when we think of Westerns, we came up with either How the West Was Won or The Magnificent Seven, and we just circled Magnificent Seven. Okay, and Neil with a great deal of confidence. Um, Jeff and Matt had the right director, uh, Uh, Sergio Leone, but uh, it's Once Upon a Time in the West. Oh. Ah. Yeah, that is correct, and there's a very iconic scene. The the bandits come in and wreck the farm, pretty much, and kill kill the family, and then the camera tilts up. And who is it but... Henry Fonda. Wow. Well, I've seen none of these, so the fact that I was able to put a movie and a director together successfully, I'm going to call it a win. That was a win. Yeah. Half a point. Good job. <laughs> All right, and we are on to question five. This one comes from Jonathan Berlingeri, so thanks for sending that in. Which coastal U.S. state has the lowest highest point? That is, which state's highest point is lower than all others? I'm in. Okay, team triviality locking in right uh, away. I'm going to shot call it, too. Looks uh. like Neil is locked in. I'm within, I'm within 10 feet. Jeff's gross. All right, so uh, Neil and Triviality are locked in, so if you guys have any thoughts that you wanted to share. Yeah, so we're, I think we've got it between two. So we've got it between either Louisiana or Florida. Um, and we say Louisiana just because I remember when uh, Hurricane Katrina hit them and all the talk how New Orleans is actually below sea level. Mm-hmm. Um, that's a fraction of the state. Uh, I don't know much about northern Louisiana. And then with Florida, for some reason in my head, I'm thinking there was a, and I feel like I might have even heard it on a trivia podcast. There was a question about the flattest state, and I think everyone playing the game guessed like, you know, Kansas, Nebraska, places like that. And we were shocked, or I was shocked to hear Florida as the answer. Um, so if it's flat, it would that would suggest that there's no high places in it either. Um, I think. Yeah, yeah, I think we're gonna lock in. You know, we're gonna lock in Florida. Okay, Florida, and Team Triviality. So um, I'm not 100% sure on that one. So I I think Kansas may be the flattest state, um, but it is a much higher elevation um, on average. Um, for the record, all states are flatter than a pancake. Um, but we said Florida, and I believe it's 353 feet is its highest point. Okay. Shot caller. Neil? Uh, yeah, so um, I just kind of locked in right away. For some reason, in the back of my head, um, I had Florida um, for two reasons. One, I think I may have read this in a John Green book. And the other reason was uh, I love Florida, but anytime there's like a crazy fact and some weird shit is happening, it's always in Florida. So I, that's why I went with Florida. The correct answer is Florida. So Neil still keeping pace with, with everybody somehow, some way. Okay, moving on. I want to know. I want to know how high it is. Do you not know? 345 feet. Wow. I was within 10 feet. <laughs> Good, Good for you. That's what you said you would be within 10, right? Your yeah. prize is nothing. <laughs> All right. Let's move on to question six. Shared by a planned 2019 film release, what is the subtitle of the first Godzilla film to receive an American adaptation in 1956? I'm in with my best guess. And... The subtitle is the name of a 2019 movie. It's it's the planned. It's the title right now for the 2019 film release, and it's also the name of the original that was uh, 
work done by an American studio. Mm -hmm. Team Yeehaw's e locked in. All right. Okay. Bring back I, Matthew I, I Roger. It doesn't make a difference to me. I don't know it's for sure either of, way. I think it's one of these two. Uh, so we're, we're stuck between Godzilla versus King Kong and Godzilla versus Mechagodzilla. And uh, I think because they've recently made a Kong movie and they're always trying to reboot those old monster movies that King Kong is probably the way to go. So we're going to lock in with Godzilla versus King Kong. Okay. Let's uh, move on to the team in Houston. Yeah, we said uh, if this is not the subtitle, it would make for a great ballsy marketing subtitle. We said King of the Monsters. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Neil. Uh, so, yeah, so after the release of uh, Kong Skull Island, they teased uh, Godzilla and like Mothra and things like that. And um, they're going to have a, a film where Godzilla fights King Kong. Some people are petitioning to have Pacific Rim in that duo as well. But uh, I remember the marketing materials that they had that they were announcing this film. And I believe uh, Team Yeehaw is correct. It is Godzilla King of the Monsters. Yep, you guys are both correct. It is Godzilla King oh. of the Monsters with an exclamation point. Number seven, it's not Chekhov's gun this time, but the concept that the simplest explanation is often also the most preferable Got can it. be described as what? So it's uh, the answer is presented in the same um, format as Chekhov's gun, so it's blank's blank. Mm -hmm. If I didn't get this right, I'd have to turn my degree in. Yeah. We're, we're locked in on Houston. Okay. And finally, the only person having difficulty with this one is Neil. Uh, so, yeah, Chekhov's gun is what I would know it by. I don't know what the other term of it is. Um, That's not the question. Yeah, Chekhov's, uh, I'm gonna gun, do you a Chekhov's favor. gun was just a, not a formatting, the uh, oh. formatting hint because I want the answer in the form of blanks blank. Oh, I see. I could be wrong, but I feel like this is the, the same quote that Sherlock Holmes always talks to Watson about. About, uh, you know, sometimes, Watson, the simplest answer is blah, 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 or whatever. The correct answer is the simplest, but I have no idea what that's called. So uh, I'm just going to lock in with elementary. Okay. So Neil is wrong. Let's go with Team Triviality. I imagine he would be quite deadly with an edge weapon. This would be Occam's Razor. Oh, that's right. And uh, Makes the team, cutting clean. Team Yeehaw? Uh, yeah, we also had Occam's Razor. And points for you guys for Occam's Razor. I have, right. I have heard that before. All right, and moving on to number eight. Lockjaw can be the first symptom and also an alternate name for what disease caused by Clostridium titani. Yep, we're good. Team Yeehaw is also locked in. Okay. This was a, a big fear of mine when I was a child that it happened <laughs> to me, actually. <laughs> uh, okay, I, I'm just going to lock in with TMJ. Okay, and uh, it's Team uh, Yeehaw. We said uh, tetanus. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Yes. We're very much glad that uh, Neil didn't get a boost from thinking it out. Tetanus. Yep. The correct answer is tetanus. Uh, good job, guys. All right. Moving on to question nine. What musical tops the list of longest running show on Broadway? Two musical questions. This, this game yeah, that was reason. the one that came to mind for me, so I think we're good. Okay. All right. Locking in right away. You can you can speak freely, guys. Uh, everybody's locked. Yeah. So yeah. we so we've got so we we've had this question of pub quiz a long time ago, and we missed it. And the answers we have down are cats, which is famous, I think, for the most runs, but that's different than the oldest, maybe. And then we have Oklahoma, and then we have Phantom of the Opera. And I'm leaning Phantom of the Opera, but I feel like I was leaning Phantom of the Opera the time that we missed the question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember us discussing cats and <laughs> Phantom for sure. Yeah. Um, let's do just 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 for the sake of time, since you guys are being patient with us. Let's uh, we will lock in Phantom of the Opera as our answer. Okay, Phantom of the Opera for our friends in Houston, uh, Neil. So <clears throat> I had uh, three answers as well that I was debating over. Um, I had written a question about the most profitable uh, musicals of all time, and uh, Phantom of the Opera is, is right up there. Uh, along with Lion King, which were two of the ones I've written down. Uh, I believe Cats was surpassed uh, as longest running. Um, so I was thinking of going with Phantom of the Opera. I was actually very, very close to locking in with that. And then I remembered a poster when uh, Emma Stone um, uh, portrayed a character in this musical for a short run in New York when I was there, uh, which was Chicago, which I think may have just become the longest running musical uh, of all time. So I wrote Chicago. Yeah. Okay, Triviality. 
Um, I mean, I had always seen it promoted as the longest running musical, um, but that might have been a while ago. So I just couldn't get past Cats. So we said Cats. Well, based on my research, uh, it is The Phantom of the Opera, oh, wow. which has been continuously running since January 26, okay. 1988. Wow. Um, some of those were pretty uh, towards the top of the list, including Chicago. I think Cats was a little bit w- of a ways down the list. Yeah, Lion King as being one of the most profitable is interesting because that is one of the shorter of the ones that we've mentioned. So uh, No, it's, it was actually pretty high on the list. It was in the top five for sure of longest. Of longest? Story. Yeah. How long has it been running then? 1997? Yeah, so it's like right before 2000. I mean, but Phantom it, of the Opera has it beaten by 12 years then. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's I should have gone with Phantom. Debate. I just want to double check that while All you're right. talking. And moving on to the final question in regulation, and it's lyrics. I'm just going to read lyrics. Let me know what song this is. I watched you suffer a dull, aching pain. Now you've decided to show me the same. No sweeping exit or offstage lines could make me feel bitter or treat you unkind. Yeah, these are always terrible because it's like, oh. Tell you what, I'll take take artist on this. I've probably heard this. Artist or song. Artist or oh, song. we can just give artist? I'm going to do artist or song. We're locked in with an artist. Okay. Neil's just looking up the lyrics here. No. <laughs> I'm, I'm locked in. I'm just I'm looking up. Neil's locked in. He's back on musicals. He doesn't care so about it's, questions. So uh, it's to you guys in Houston. Oh, man. Yeah, so you guys were generous and just said we could do artist. And, and Jason had the idea. It sounds like sort of a, a breakup song in the line of Taylor Swift or Adele. Mm. And so... Uh, we said it. We, we went with Adele. Okay. Uh, Neil? Uh, I didn't know uh, this song. Uh, he, he's written songs that are, are kind of deep like this, so I just put Ben Folds. Okay. Mm. <clears throat> and we went a completely opposite direction and put Depeche Mode. Well, you guys were all a little bit off the mark here. It is from Wild Horses by Rolling Stones. Oh, yes, it is. Jeez. <laughs> Did that come to you right as... Well, as soon as he said it, I was like, I could place the, yeah, yeah. I could place the tune. Yeah, this and is a... Oh, sorry. Go ahead. That'll bring us to the end of regulation. Uh, if Neil could please provide the updated scores, we can go into the final round. Uh, I had a clarification here on the Broadway one. I, I know where my my uh, thinking went wrong. So um, Chicago is the longest running musical revival and the longest running American musical in Broadway history. It is the second longest running show in Broadway history behind the Family Opera. So I don't really know... Maybe it's the longest running show, meaning show like it premiered earlier yeah. than Family Opera. Mm. I so saw that's, that. but not but not in total amount of but not in total time. amount of performances. I saw that yeah, list and it had Lion King and then Cats. Cats were like fourth on it. All right, after regulation, the scores are in. In third place is Team Triviality with 110 points. Uh, narrowly in front of them is Team Yeehaw with 115 points, and uh, remaining the lead but not for long is myself with 130 points. All right. So moving on to the final in which our uh, teams can wager 0 to 30 points on the following categories, which I'll present right now. Number one, surrealism. Number two, cartoon names. Number three, bizarre products. Number four, crime fighters. And number five, sci-fi adaptation. Okay, with a little bit of discussion, it looks like all the wagers are in, and we will now read the uh, final round questions. Number one, in Surrealism. The Son of Man, a painting by René Magritte, is a painting of a man, and notably, what else? Number two, cartoon names. Milhouse Van Houten. From the show, The Simpsons' first name may have been inspired by the middle name of President Richard Nixon. Milhouse's middle name, on the other hand, is taken from what dictator? Do you wait, write down the middle name? I don't know. Number three, oh. Bizarre Products. Between 2000 and 2006, Easy Squirt was a product on the market that came in the colors Blast and Green, Funky Purple, Stellar Blue, Passion Pink, Awesome Orange, and Totally Teal. What brand and product was this? Crime Fighters. What crime-fighting duo 
would you find driving around in a Chrysler Imperial Crown named Black Beauty? And finally, in sci-fi adaptations, what is the film based on the short story by Philip K. Dick entitled We Can Remember It For You Wholesale? That's the name of the short story? Yes. Okay, uh, after some discussion, uh, Team Triviality and Neil are locked in. Uh, Neil was in the other room coming up with his answers, so he couldn't hear Triviality's discussion. Um, where were you guys falling on some of these? Uh, did you find them difficult, coming pretty quick? Uh, uh, some quicker than others. Some are educated guesses. So, wagering 10 from Triviality, 10 from Yeehaw, and 10 from Neil in Surrealism. I wanted to know... What was featured in The Son of Man by Rene Magritte besides the man? Let's start with triviality. Uh, we had nothing on this one. Uh, we just had a clock. Just pulling from your knowledge of surrealism. <laughs> okay. Neil? Uh, I, I had no idea on this one, so I just put a boy. Okay. And uh, yeehaw. Uh, we said apple. Mm. That's right. It is the green apple that floats in front of the man's face. Yeah. So 10 points for Team Yeehaw. That seems familiar now. Not for you, Jeff. I still can't picture it, ah. but I'm sure if I saw the painting, yeah. then it would come back. Okay. And going on to number two, uh, cartoon names. I needed to know what dictator Milhouse Van Houten's middle name is derived from. Triviality, wager 20, Yeehaw 20, and Neil 0. So, yeah, I, I mean... Adolf sounded. I I didn't know this one, uh, and I know I've seen like every episode of The Simpsons, and I can't remember this. Uh, Adolf sounded the best, but I don't think that they would do that. Uh, the show started in the '90s, but they probably didn't name him till later. But we still just put Fidel. Fidel. Okay, Neil. I had no idea. I'm not, uh, you know, a huge Simpsons fan. I just haven't really seen them, so I I just said Kim Jong Un. Okay. <laughs> and uh, Team Eha. Yeah, we, we, we had no idea either. And and our, our logic was, if you say name a dictator, most people are going to say Hitler, which would, if that's the answer, that didn't seem like that would be difficult enough to to, to put in the finale. Okay. So we said we went with uh, Joseph Stalin. Okay. And the answer is Benito Mussolini. Oh. In uh, one of the episodes, Milhouse shows up to be Lisa's Italian tutor, and she goes, you speak Italian? And he recounts uh, the tale of how he... Uh, hung out with his grandma in the Italian countryside, and she refers to him by Milhouse Mussolini Van Houten. And he says, that's how I learned Italian and started to wet my bed, because she starts beating him with a branch. <laughs> <laughs> what are the points on that That one? is uh, not familiar to me. All right, moving on to question three, which was in Bizarre Products. What Triviality the... wagered 20, Yeehaw 10, and Neil 0. So I wanted to know about the Easy Squirt product. What was the... Uh, brand and product on that one triviality uh this one i remember fondly uh my parents would never buy it for me because they said you don't need to put green ketchup on your hot dog we said heinz ketchup okay neil uh, i didn't know this one i just said gack okay and uh team yeehaw and we also went with heinz ketchup all right that's a plus 10 for you guys moving on to question four what crime-fighting duo would you find driving around in a Chrysler Imperial Crown nicknamed Black Beauty? Let's start with Neil. And uh, for this one, Neil wagered 10, Team Yeehaw 0, and Triviality 10. Let's start with Neil. So this one I had a lot of trouble with. Uh, I was trying to go through crime-fighting duo. So originally, when you said Black Beauty, it made me think of Supernatural, but they drive an Impala, and they're not technically a crime-fighting duo. They just you know fight supernatural things. Then I was like, is Ken saying that the Blues Brothers are a crime-fighting duo, which kind of, not really, uh, but I don't think their car is called Black Beauty. Um, and then I started thinking about what, what are some famous black cars that two people would drive around. And I kept thinking and thinking, and then going over an edit I just did of Game of Death that has Bruce Lee in the beginning. I was like, wait a minute, Bruce Lee was in a duo that drove in a black car, and I put Green Hornet. Mm. Green Hornet. Okay, how about Triviality? Yeah, Green Hornet's a great guess. Um I was thinking that maybe that this was the original Batmobile. So we said Batman and Robin. Okay. And Yeehaw. We were very thankful we bet zero. We had no idea. We put Starsky and Hutch. Okay. The correct answer was Green Hornet and Kato. So Neil got points on that one. And finally, sci-fi adaptation. Um, 
Triviality wagered 10, Yeehaw 10, and Neil went big in 30. So let's see what happens here. I wanted to know the film based on the short story by Philip K. Dick entitled We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. So, triviality. Uh, we took a guess with the adaptation uh, with Keanu Reeves uh, and went with a Scanner Darkly. Scanner Darkly, not a bad guess. Mm. Uh, that is a Philip K. Dick book, but that was also called Scanner Darkly. <laughs> uh, Neil? Yeah, so this one, it got me really nervous. Uh, I was trying to go through all the titles. Um, when you put sci-fi adaptation, I had a feeling you might have gone like, you know, Dune or Blade Runner or something. And I remember Blade Runner is uh, like electric sheep who dream or something like that the only other one that i really could think of uh and it sounds right that it pairs well with this movie but um i'm not 100 percent sure but the only one i know that's based on a philip k dick novel that uh probably wasn't what he intended was total recall with arnold schwarzenegger mm-hmm. okay total recall and team Eha. yeah we um <clears throat> Uh, when you started reading the question, we were hoping it was going to be uh do androids dream of electric sheep kind of thing but we ended up um we had it down between Eternal Sun. We were just guessing based on like memory. Mm-hmm. So, Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind, which doesn't seem like a sci-fi adaptation. Maybe the book was, if it was a book. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we ended up locking in with uh, Inception. Not even, not even knowing if it's an adaptation of anything at all. But Inception was our answer. Okay. And once again, Neil's coming through with Total Recall <laughs> for a plus thirty. Wow. So at the end of. Um, the uh, final round, it looks like Triviality's netted a minus 30, Yeehaw's netted a minus 10, and ne- uh, Neil is plus 30 on the round. Okay, so now for the final scores. In third place, Team Triviality had 80 points on the game. Um, Team Yeehaw, out there in Houston, Texas, had 105. And in a shocker, shocking turn of events, Neil, who wasn't going to play at all, gets 160 and is today's cream of the crop. Outside interference here in my moment of glory. Yeah, this was an interesting game. I, I played about as well as I normally do. Like in the normal rounds, I get you know three or four out of uh, ten. Um, really, the mid round kind of saved me, and I'm just usually I I either bet too conservatively or too big, and um, luckily I did okay in the final yeah, round. But you, you were getting questions that were like in geography and in science and stuff that you usually don't get too. So. I mean, all around, good game from Neil, and a little surprising in certain categories, but uh, but you just pulled this one out. Well, as George Costanza would say, I'm out. That's it for me now, guys. <laughs> Thanks, Triviality. Thank you, listeners. Yeah, and great yeah. game from you guys in Houston, too. That was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. yeah it was, we had a blast, too. It, it was fun. Neil kicked her butt. Well-deserved win for him. <laughs> yeah. Shocking. Shocking turn of events. It but, won't happen again, but you guys are awesome, and... Uh, you know, special thanks to uh, to Jason and then also to David, who are, is our first Patreon supporter ever, uh, who's been there with us since the beginning. Um, you know, thank you for that and for the support because, uh, you know, you sort of started the trend of supporting Triviality, so we appreciate it. Yeah, and thanks for being on the show, too. No, oh, sure. Well, you guys, you guys entertain me while I sit in awful Houston traffic, so if I can, <laughs> throw, you, if I can throw you a few bucks a month, that's the least I can do. So uh, before we uh, take us out here, was there anything that you guys wanted to mention? Yeah, just uh, just real quick, a shout out to the wife for watching the kids, so I can have a couple hours this morning to record. Um, yeah, there you go. That's that's a wise move, sir. Yeah. Also, also just a shout out to our regular Wednesday night trivia team: uh, Melissa, Ben, Lori, Jenny, Mary, um, all those guys who uh, usually are our better half as far as trivia is concerned. Uh, thanks for them for teaching us a few things over uh, over the years, and uh, we'll see you Wednesday night. Yeah. fantastic well thank you guys again for joining us and thanks to the gentleman in the studio for playing along to my game and if you'd like to play along with our contestants make sure you check out our facebook page download our score sheet and uh, you can get in touch with us uh, via the email um, via twitter and of course the facebook we do now have our website with links to all those at uh, www.trivialitypodcast.com and of course our patreon page we would appreciate any and all donations of course, other than spreading the word, the best way you can support the show is by rating, reviewing, and subscribing to Triviality on your favorite podcast app. And until next time, on behalf of the gentleman in the studio, our friends in Houston, and myself, that was Triviality. Hello, I'm Johnny Cat. Where can I take you tonight? Drive. 
Drive! Would you please repeat the destination? Go anywhere, just go! Go! Please state a street and number. I'm not familiar with that address. Would you please repeat the destination?